thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. And as he shared with us in Revelation chapter 22, we're finding that tree of life is going to be there in heaven. And every month it's going to bear a new fruit, even as I saw I'm excited to see what flavors and what fruits are going to be on there. Because the Bible says, I had not seen nor ear heard, neither entered into the hearts of men the things that God has prepared for those who love him. You know, beloved, principles of health from the Bible are not old-fashioned. They're actually very fundamental. And you'll be fine as you go through the history, you'll find that God has always given his people the best and is trying to lead us back to trust him that his best has always been what he gave. For example, when you go back in the book of Daniel, as we were studying, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. But he asked, give me 10 days trial for he and his three friends, captives in Babylon, going through the pagan education system for three years. And God preserved them and they were 10 times fairer and fatter in flesh, healthier and ruddy, and their minds 10 times wiser, intelligent and spiritual and discerning. God is no respecter of person. What he did for Daniel and his three friends, he desires to do for you, my friend. And the other blessed thing is you go through history. God in Genesis and Exodus chapter 16, he gave his people manna that rained down each day in the wilderness. Except on the Friday, there was a double portion of manna that they were to gather in the morning. Because Sabbath morning, the seventh day, there was no manna to be found, nor to be gathered. And it's a lesson for us. That God, even way back before Exodus 20 of the Ten Commandments, he was teaching his people about the importance of the seventh-day Sabbath rest. I pray that you've been greatly blessed. Unfortunately, as they were fed by manna, angels' food for 40, day, 40 years in the wilderness, shortly thereafter they became tiresome of that manna. And they said, give us the flesh pots of Egypt as recorded in Leviticus chapter 11, and you'll find in Numbers chapter 11, you'll find the history where they cried out for the flesh food, and for a whole month, they had so much flesh, quail coming out of their ears, it says in their nostrils, not their ears, but their nostrils, and as you go through, it was so nauseating, many perished because of gluttony, God truly gave them the best diet, but when they asked for something different, they received the results. Brethren, it's a touch of faith for all of us. Tonight, we have the message from Pastor Bachelor, the King's Ambassador. I'm excited to hear what he wants to share with us. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, your kindness, for your word. Send thy Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds, to enter into your true peace and the joy of your Sabbath day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll see you later. Questions, answers, just click on the Q&A tab. And we'll be more than happy to answer whatever questions you have. We'll see you after Pastor Bachelor has his question and answer series. God bless and enjoy the message. Hi, friends. Would you like to hear an amazing fact? In November 2019, a home intruder in Rochester, New York, thought he'd found an easy target. He was going to break into the home of an 82-year-old lone woman rough her up a little bit, take some money for drugs. He began to bang on the door and say he needed medical help. She realized there was something wrong and she called 911. Eventually, he kicked down the door and he got the surprise of his life. He was clobbered with a table. And while he was on the ground, then he got beat up with a large shampoo bottle and then a broomstick. He was happy when the ambulance came to rescue him from Willie Murphy, who was a professional bodybuilder. 82 years old, she could deadlift 225 pounds. You know, the Bible tells us that God gives strength to the weak. We're going to talk about it in this presentation of Revelation Now.
friends, we'd like to welcome all of you once again to Revelation Now. As we've been looking at some very important Bible prophecies, we have an important program, so we are delighted that you're tuning in, part of our extended worldwide study family, all gathered together studying the Word of God. Now, we'd like to remind you that immediately following the program, we will be taking your Bible questions. So this is a good time. If you have a Bible-related question, you can type it in the comment section on Facebook. That's on the Amazing Facts Facebook page or the Doug Batchelor Facebook page. We'll try to answer as many of those questions as we can, given the time at the end of the program. Also, we'd like to remind you we are translating this live into Spanish. And if you prefer to hear it in Spanish, you can just go to the Amazing Facts Latino Facebook page or the Amazing Facts YouTube channel. We're also providing sign language for the deaf. More information about that is at the Revelation Now website. We'd like to thank all of those who have contacted us and told us that you've been watching and that the programs have been a blessing. And I'll just share a few of them. We have Rona from Texas, and she wrote and said, We are really enjoying the series. My husband and I are getting baptized this Sabbath. Thank you. Those are the kind of testimonies that we like to hear. We also have Anna, who is listening from Omar, and she says, God bless your ministry, and thank you for the Revelation Now programs. And then we have Joseph from Belgium who says, I've been blessed by your programs and I've been tuning in every night. May God bless you. And then we got an interesting uh, email that came from Olaf and his family. And we got a picture we'll put up on the screen. They live 200 miles north of the Arctic Circle in Canada. So they're way up there. And they said, we watch all the time. The broadcasts are God sent and make us feel part of the family. So we'd like to greet those who are watching all the way up there north in Canada. Well, tonight our presentation is entitled, The King's Ambassador, and a uh, very important presentation. We do have a lesson that goes along with the study. The lesson's got a bit of a different name. It's called The Road Back. If you'd like to get a free download of the lesson, just go to the Revelation Now website. You can click on the resources, download today's lesson. We also have a free offer, a book entitled Alone in the Crowd, and again, this is free. If you'd like to receive a digital copy of the book, text the word CROWD to the number 40544 and you'll receive a digital download. If you're outside of North America or if you're up there in the Arctic Circle, whatever's going to be easier, you might want to go to the Revelation Now website and you'll be able to download the book right there at Revelation Now. Now, there's something else we want to let you know about. We know we have a lot of young people that have tuned in, part of the Revelation Now series. And Amazing Facts is preparing something very special in March. We're going to be having a special youth event, special youth weekend, right here at the Amazing Facts World Headquarters in Sacramento, California. So we wanted you to know about that. And if you're in the area, we want to encourage you to come. You're welcome to fly in depending upon what's happening with the COVID at that time, but it will be live broadcast. And the dates for that is March the 18th through the 20th, 2021. And if you'd like to learn more about that, just go to afyouth.com, and there is a place where you can put in your email, and you can get updates as we get closer to that event. Again, it's March 18th through 20, a very special youth rally training event that will be happening here an amazing fact. So I hope you'll take advantage of that. I'd like to invite Pastor Doug to come forward at this time as we prepare for our study, again entitled, The King's Ambassador. Well, good evening, Pastor Doug. Good evening, Pastor Ross. We're having a lot of rain in Northern California. It's kind of nice. The Lord. We need it, but we're we asking that the Holy Spirit would rain down Amen. wherever we are. So let's start with prayer. Dear Father, once again, we are grateful that we're able to open up your word and study an important subject once again tonight. And as we always do, we ask for the Holy Spirit to come and fill our hearts and guide our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ross. And as always, uh, immediately following this aspect of our presentation, Pastor Ross will join me again to answer your Bible questions, especially any questions you may have about tonight's presentation or other subjects that we've covered in the past. And I should mention that, you know, we've got one more presentation tomorrow morning at 11. We're going to talk to you about how to know that you've experienced a genuine conversion and you're ready for Jesus coming and how you can get other people ready for Jesus coming. So please join us at 11 a.m. Pacific time on this channel or Facebook, whatever you're watching, and we'd love to have you tune in. 
Um, our subject tonight is a very important one. We're talking about the king's ambassadors. And as always, we like to begin with a foundation in Revelation. And so if you go to Revelation chapter 7, now we've touched on this verse briefly, but I promise we go a little deeper. In Revelation chapter 7, it talks about the 144,000. And it begins by saying, After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that would be north, south, east, west, talking about a global event, that the wind should not blow upon the earth or the sea or any tree. These are winds of turmoil or strife. And, but then he sees another angel coming from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he says, do not hurt the earth or the sea or the trees. Do not let those winds of strife go. And right now, friends, it looks like all the pent-up winds of strife are about to blow. And when you see what's happening in the world, until something happens, what is it that needs to happen? Till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And don't be misled by the picture. We just put those in to help visualize things. The seal is not an external seal. It is something internal. And it says, I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now, there's been a little bit of confusion about who are the 144,000. It tells us, as you continue reading on in the chapter, it says there's 12,000 from the 12 tribes and it leaves out the tribe of Dan and Ephraim. It includes Joseph and Levi. It's a unique list when it gives the sons of Jacob. It's a different list than you find anywhere else in the Bible. And people are wondering, does this mean in the last days before Jesus comes back that the Lord is going to raise up 12,000 from the tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh and Asher and Zebulun? Not, Ephraim is not included. I should uh, correct that. But from Asher, Manasseh, Zebulun, Issachar, are these literal Israelites? Well, some of them may be. But remember, the proper names in Revelation almost always are symbolic. When it talks about Jezebel and Balaam and Apollyon and, um, you know, uh, these other names, Egypt, it's always talking about a, a symbolic meaning in these names. So when you look at the names of the 144,000, in the order that they're listed, find out, well, what does that word mean in the original language? For instance, when Rachel and Leah were having their boys and they named them, uh, Leah said, I will praise the Lord. That's what Judah means. And then Reuben means, he has looked on me. The word Gad means, given good fortune. Asher means, happy am I. Naphtali, my wrestling. Manasseh means, making me to forget. Remember, this is a unique order, and I think there's a reason. Simeon means God hears me. Levi means attached to me. Issachar purchased me. Zebulun, dwelling. And Joseph, God will add to me, Benjamin's son of his right hand. You take this list the way that it is here in Revelation chapter 7. Just put the definitions of the names in order, and it tells the story of the plan of salvation. This is what it says. I will praise the Lord for he has looked on me and granted good fortune. I am happy because my wrestling God is making me to forget. God hears me and is joined me. Joined or attached, same word. That means married. He has purchased me a dwelling and will add to me the son of his right hand. This is the story of the gospel and Jesus rescuing and redeeming man. It's in the names. So who are the 144,000? Are they real people? Yes. You see, before Jesus came the first time, he sent out people like John the Baptist to help prepare the way. He had the 12 apostles that were a special group that was called to prepare his people for his first coming. You remember when Jesus went to heaven, he told the apostles at first, he said, do not go in the way of the Gentiles. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then later they went on to the Gentiles. But first three and a half years, they only preached to the Jews. God used 12 apostles, filled them with the Holy Spirit to do a special work. As a result of their ministry, a great multitude was baptized during the time of the first coming and the former reign. The 144,000 
are 12 times 12,000 that are getting the world ready for the second coming. And so it's good for us to study these uh, ambassadors that are getting the world ready because that's the life that we're going to live. Look at the characteristics we read. And I've summarized them here from Revelation 7, mentions 144,000, and in Revelation 14. It says, they're redeemed from among men. They're without fault. They're undefiled. They are first fruits, like the apostles were, the first that he called. They are without deceit. It says they're without guile. That's, by the way, what Jesus said to Nathaniel. Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. He's honest, integrity. And they follow the Lamb wherever he goes. One thing you could say about the 12 apostles. You saw Jesus, you saw 12 guys following him. Now, the 144,000 follow the Lamb wherever he goes. If you want to follow the Lamb in heaven, you must first follow him here. And we're going to talk about some of the practical things the Bible has to say about what does it mean to be an ambassador for Christ and to be a real Bible Christian. And then it says that this time of trouble is not released on the world until the servants of God are sealed. Now, first and foremost, that seal of God is the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit wherewith you are sealed for the day of redemption. That's Ephesians chapter 4. And it talks about the seal of the Holy Spirit in Ephesians chapter 1. And so there's several references, I think at least three in the Bible, that say the Holy Spirit is that inner seal. But there's also something that is evident in the life. The Bible tells us that um, Isaiah chapter 8, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. The law of God being sealed in the heart is the new covenant. What's the new covenant? I'll write my law in their hearts, right? So the law is in the heart, but even in the law of God, there's one commandment that has the word holy, one commandment that begins with the word remember. It's the longest of the Ten Commandments. It has to do with our time. And by the way, if you don't have time, you don't have anything. Time is what life is made of, quoting Benjamin Franklin. But we show our love for God in our time. And so this is a special seal. God said that his Sabbath is a sign that he is our Redeemer, that he can recreate us because he created the world in six days. Every Sabbath, we remember that we didn't evolve. We're made in the image of God. And much of the Christian world has forgotten this. The 144,000 are going to be holy. They'll be proclaiming the truth to the world. And this message, I should probably say before I get too deep, let me issue a little um, disclaimer. If you've not accepted Jesus, you want to change the channel right now. Watch something else. This message is probably going to be meat. It's not milk. And you may find yourself choking. Uh, this is designed for people who say, I love Jesus and I want to know how I can please Jesus. And so I'll let you decide if you want to proceed. You may just out of curiosity. But if, if you don't have the Spirit of God and you haven't surrendered your life to Christ, if you don't have a hunger to know what pleases Him, this may actually um, be a message that will annoy you or you'll misunderstand it. But I'll do my best to present it in the spirit of Christ. We're going to go out on the street. We're going to ask our fellow citizens, and we've got some of the same people that we asked a number of questions, find out what they have to say about uh, does God expect us, does he expect Christians to be different? Um, lots of times they'll have a cross on. Um, it, you know, you can obviously conclude if they're Christian, if they are near uh, Christian church coming out. I imagine that they would wear some type of religious uh, jewelry or shirt or, you know, what would Jesus do? You can spot a Christian in a crowd by the way they behave, their body language, how they carry themselves. I don't believe that it matters what Christians wear. God don't care what you wear. Christians are supposed to hold modesty and high value, so yes, they should dress more modestly. I think that a lot of people do a lot of things that that he said in the Ten Commandments not to do. So rather it's killing, stealing, you know, dishonoring your parents, you know, putting other people above him, things like that. Like, I think those are the type of things that he really doesn't appreciate. Um, lying, um, tattoos on the body, uh, cheating, uh, let's see, just in general, doing bad things in life. When they lie, cheat, steal, commit adultery, murder, all those, the seven, seven sins. I think she was trying to remember the Ten Commandments, but she almost got to seven. 
I think she got four. <laughs> and some of the people, how do you know a Christian? Because they're wearing Christian jewelry or they're hanging around with Christian groups. It's interesting the answers you get. Uh, some of them got it pretty close. It's something on the inside. Now we're going to talk about um, how a Christian really lives a life that is consecrated to God and will their life be different? You know, our story that we're going to is the story of John the Baptist. Because in the same way that John the Baptist was called to prepare the world for Jesus' first coming, he introduced Christ. He said, this is the Lamb of God. God has a group of people in the last days that will prepare the world for the second coming. You remember when Jesus was talking about John the Baptist, he said, John the Baptist is the one who came in the spirit and power of Elijah. But he said there is going to be another Elijah. He said, Elijah has come and Elijah will come. Last prophecy in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, says, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. The work of Elijah and the work of the 144,000 is going to be to just let the light and power of the gospel go in a double Pentecostal power to prepare the world for Jesus' coming. Not everyone, most people will not accept Christ, but there is going to be a great revival of people who are really going to live out the Christian principles in their lives before Jesus comes back. We're going to talk about some of the practical things connected with being a Christian. Now, we're looking at John the Baptist and his life, and I want you to notice a number of things. Christ said he was the greatest of the prophets. He introduced Jesus. First question, what was one secret of John's spirit-filled life? Luke 3, verse 16, he said, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I comes the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, he, it says that he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And something else you notice about John, it said he must increase and I will decrease. He was a spirit-filled person. John believed that um, his mission was to lift up Christ, not himself. A lot of prophets today, they want to attract all the attention to themselves and get credit and um, sell things. John wanted to promote Jesus. He said, he must increase and I must decrease. By the way, that is a good proverb for us to live by. If you repeat that in your prayer every day, it would probably do us some good. He must increase, I must decrease. Sin is, you know what the middle letter in sin is? I. Sin is selfishness. God is love. But the more you follow Jesus, the more it's about glorifying him and lifting him up. Did John the Baptist read the scriptures? We know that he prayed. Was he a Bible-reading prophet? What does it say? You can read in John 1.23 when they said, Who are you? They said, uh, you know, Tell us, are you Jeremiah? Are you Moses re re resurrected? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. So the message of John the Baptist was a message of <laughs> get on the straight gate. It's a message saying, prepare for the Lord. What was the first thing that John said when he started preaching? First word, repent. What was the first thing Jesus said when he started preaching? He says he began preaching saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John and Jesus called people to repentance. Repentance for what? Sin. What is sin? Transgression of the law. And it manifests itself a number of ways in our lives. Jesus said you'll know them by their fruits. People think it's legalistic if you examine yourself and say, am I in the faith? The Lord tells us to do that. Are we surrendering ourselves or are we becoming encumbered with the cares of this life and the things of the world? John was a Bible reader. That's how he could quote this scripture to the uh, scribes and Pharisees when they came. The Bible tells us in Matthew 5, verse 8, blessed, what does blessed mean? Happy. Blessed are the pure in heart they will see God. The new covenant is talking about a new heart and a purity of heart. How do you get a change of heart? Well, the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. So if you're having problems with what you're speaking, you've got a problem with what's in your heart. So you've got to be very careful what you allow in your heart because it's like a computer. What goes in is what is going to come out. You've heard the expression garbage in, garbage out. And so... Christians need to be careful what they allow into their minds and into their hearts because it affects who they are. Was John the Baptist willing to witness for Jesus? So the three great disciplines in the Christian life is to pray. We know John did that. 
The Bible tells us we should read the word. We should let our light shine. In the sanctuary, there were three articles of furniture in the holy place. There was a light. We had a witness. There was a bread. It's a word of God. There was a candle. Let your light shine. Or the altar of incense, rather. And that was uh, the prayer. So you've got these three disciplines in the Christian life. What about John? He pointed to Jesus. John 1.29. In front of everybody, he said, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so we ought to be willing to point people to Christ. And one way we do this is by our lives. Now, is there anything distinctive that we see in the life of John that shows us he really believed in living a life of consecration to God? What was the straight preaching of John, or I should say, was the straight preaching of John popular among the political and religious leaders. If you live a Christian life, you may get trouble from the state and you may get trouble from the church. This is what happened to him. The Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, not being baptized of him. John had a lot of courage. You know what he said to the scribes and Pharisees when they came to his baptism? They were coming to spy on him. He knew what was going on. He said, you brood of vipers. That's not a way to impress your pastor. You brood of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He said they needed to repent. He told everybody, you need to repent of your sins, prepare for their Lord's first coming. And I think that Christians ought to be bold. You know what Paul said? We should pray for boldness. That's Ephesians chapter 6. In Acts chapter 4, they knelt down and they prayed that God would give them boldness because they were being intimidated by the religious leaders and by the state not to talk about Jesus anymore. And they said, we are not going to be quiet. This is the most important message in the world. It's a message of life and death. Christians need to have that sense of urgency. Uh, so few Christians, they say, well, you know, religion is, it's a private matter. Don't bother anybody about religion. It's just divisive. Don't talk about religion. And the devil's intimidated the world where we're afraid to share our faith. John was not afraid. He upset the church, and he upset the state. He told the king, Herod, he said, you realize it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. That's called adultery. And it got him in so much hot water, he was ultimately imprisoned and finally executed. And we talked about this another night. But Herod, the Tetrarch, being reproved by him for all the evils which Herod had done, not just his adultery, all the evils he had done, he put, Herod, he put John in prison. What should a Christian choose to think about? Now we found out that John had a life of honesty, simplicity, consecration to God. God is calling people. You know, the Bible tells us that John came in the spirit and power of Elijah. And James tells us Elijah was a man subject to like passions as us. They were human. We think that they're saints and they're some kind of superhuman person. They were people just like us who through faith in Christ overcame and were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. To be a Christian, you've got to start thinking differently. The Bible says that uh, we need to have a, a renewing of the mind that takes place. We need to be pure in heart. How does that happen? Philippians 4, verse 8. Whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Put simply, Paul says, be positive. Be holy in your thinking, in your communications. So many people, their, their minds are always gravitating downward. They get together and they're negative and they're talking about others and they talk about the problems. And, and I catch myself doing it, you know. You, you start complaining about the government or something. It's real easy to get negative. But, you know, we've got to catch ourselves. Christians are to be Happy people, positive people. It's the gospel is good news. We ought to be a happy people. And then you got to be careful what you look at. I will set no wicked thing before my eyes, King David said. Because, you know, 90% uh, what comes into your brain comes through the medium of your vision. And back in the days when David wrote this, People did not have as much options as we have today. You know, there are more screens. I'm sitting here preaching, and you folks watching, you can't see what I see. But I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight screens. Right now, people have screens on their, their phones. They get screens on their computer. They get screens on their iPads. They get screens on their television. 
and I stopped to get gas today. You know what? Commercial popped up on the gas pump. Have you, you've all seen these, right? I sit there and start pumping gas. All of a sudden, I hear someone talking to me. And I thought there was no one around. And the gas pump is talking to me. And there's a screen trying to sell me something. So we're surrounded with information that is absolutely bombarding our senses. There's a blizzard of information coming in. We can't control all of it because like the gas pump, we're being assaulted from every side. But there's a lot of it we can control. And we choose to look at and listen to things that are not helping us to be pure in heart. And I think probably one of the single most important things that a Christian can do if they want to live a godly life is control what they feed their minds. Make conscious decisions to read spiritual things. Every day I wake up, first thing I do is I go in the office after microwaving some water. I go in the office and I read my Bible. Uh, actually, I listen to someone reading it while I read it, so I'll get more out of it that way. And then I read my Bible as I'm studying. I drive in my car. I listen to sermons. And I'm a pastor, but I'm just like everyone else. I've got the same temptations and problems everybody else has. And I know for me to maintain a spiritual health, I must surround myself with spiritual information. Now, we're lucky in this country. I've been to some countries. They have no Christian TV, no Christian radio. I want to thank our friends at 3ABN that are broadcasting. And if any of our, our friends are watching right now, I got a testimony today from somebody that said that uh, somebody was watching 3ABN. It was leading them to the Lord. And so there's good Christian programs. There's some good Christian radio programs. There's now with your phone and the Internet, you can play things on your phone while you're driving. But feed your soul. Good things. There's so much bad information and bad television and and it does affect our culture. It affects us morally. You know, they did some research, Kaiser Foundation, years ago. They found that <laughs> they got some kids that were watching Mr. Rogers, some elementary school kids, and others were watching violent cartoons. And they got them all in a room together. And the ones that had been watching the violent cartoons were doing a whole lot more kicking and fighting and yelling because of what they'd been watching. It affected their behavior. Teenagers that watch these violent video games that become absolutely addicted to them, Grand Theft Auto and things like that. They've got cases that are documented of young people that kill police and their principal entertainment was watching programs that kill police. And it, the students involved in the Columbine massacre, they were all involved in this, this satanic music, talking about murder and killing and death. And we think it's not going to affect us. It does. Garbage in, garbage out. We've got to control what we watch. Set no wicked thing before my eyes. You know, I don't want to leave that before I add something. There's a lot of Christians who say, um, well, yeah, I know I watch TV programs where uh, they use the Lord's name in vain, and there's a little bit of adultery happening, typical soap opera, and uh, there's a little bit of murder happening even in a cowboy movie, and uh, I would never do those things, but I am entertained by it. You know, it's almost like you're sinning vicariously by watching someone else do these things. And Paul actually says, God is not only going to judge those that do those, but those have, that have pleasure in those that do it. And so I think we might need to do some soul searching and saying, Lord, is this helping me become like you? Was there a connection between John's spirit-filled life and his simple diet? Now, we talked the other day about some Christian principles using the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation that say it makes a difference what you eat, your health, and even your spiritual health. Was there something unique about John's diet? It says, yes, he will need, eat neither, he will drink neither wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, I think it's in Ephesians, it tells us, be not drunk, with wine, which is dissipation, but rather be filled with the Spirit. You drive down the streets here in Granite Bay or Sacramento, you'll see signs that says, beer, wine, and spirits. Where in the world to get that word? I mean, we all want the right spirit. What kind of spirit do you get at a liquor store? You get the wrong spirit. <laughs> and so, and you drink that, and you'll have the wrong spirit. It says, he will drink neither wine nor strong drink, that he might be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why is God concerned about what we eat and what we drink? It tells us, Behold, you will conceive and bear a son. Now, this is what the angel told the parents of Samson. 
you will conceive and bear a son. Now drink no wine or strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing. For the child will be a Nazarite to God from the, his womb to the day of his death. Now there's a couple of things to consider about Samson. Uh, the angel went to Manoah and his wife. I always wonder what her name was. It's just Manoah and his wife. And the angel first appeared to her. She told her husband. He prayed the angel would come back. He said, I, I really would like to see this myself. The angel said, okay. Came back. He told them both. He says, you're going to bear a son, and he is going to be very powerful, but you must cooperate with God's laws of health. He's going to be spirit-filled, but he's also going to have supernatural strength. Do not eat anything unclean. Do not drink the wrong thing. Take care of yourself, even in the prenatal state, and help facilitate his being this spirit-filled powerhouse that Samson was. And I'm looking forward to getting to heaven and seeing the DVD of him slaying a thousand men single-handedly. But notice the connection that God made between no alcohol. By the way, a lot of birth defects and cerebral palsy are caused by alcoholism in the parents. Know ye not, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God. We're not supposed to be bringing any unclean thing into our body. Now, we talked about the distinction God makes in his word between there are foods and meats that are clean and unclean. And in the Old Testament sanctuary, the greatest insult that you could offer God, in fact, uh, there is one Greek king, he wanted to um, insult the Jews, and he brought a pig into the sanctuary and butchered it. And uh, some people forget their bodies in the temple of the Holy Spirit. Pigs and these scavengers that people eat, their garbage cans. We don't want to defile our body temples with those things. Now, I know, there's going to be people in heaven that didn't know this and God winks at our ignorance. But God's people before Jesus comes, think about it. Is Christ coming for a church that has failed to fulfill his will or one that has succeeded? Even though we see during the Dark Ages many of God's people, just like ancient Israel, we've drifted far from the ideal. When he comes back, is he going to have a people that are closer to the ideal? I think so. The devil is saying, oh, you, your standards are too high, God. You're never going to find people to follow you. And Jesus said, just watch. In the last days, he is going to pour out his Holy Spirit on people, and they're going to be willing to deny themselves and seek first God's kingdom. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. This will be a characteristic of God's people in the last days. What's the Bible say about just worldly behavior in general? Whoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And again, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. See, it's not just the Old Testament. This is New Testament. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. We serve a holy God. He is calling us to holiness. You know, the amazing thing about a Christian is God will take a, an unconverted person in a defiled world. He will fill them with his Holy Spirit and put them back in that world and let them empower them to live a holy life in an unholy world. Someone said a Christian is kind of like a boat in the water. A boat looks normal in the water. You don't want the water in the boat. If you get the water in the boat, it goes down. God wants his people to be in the world. Jesus said, I'm not taking you out of the world. I want you in the world, but I don't want you of the world. So we've got to be in the world like light in the darkness, like salt has a preserving influence. We are to add the salt and the light to this world that is perishing. God said to... Uh, Abraham, he said, I'm going to destroy Sodom. Abraham said, oh boy, I got my nephew Lot and his family there. Lord, if, if we can find 50 righteous in the city, would you spare it? God said, sure. If there's 50 righteous, I'll spare it. Then he thought about Sodom. He said, wow, I don't know if we're going to get 50. How about 40, Lord? God said, I'll spare it for 40. 40 people in that city can make a difference. Abraham kept thinking. He said, last time I was at Sodom, it was pretty bad shape. What about 30? 25, 10? God said, if there are 10 righteous people, I will spare that city for 10 righteous people. Think of the influence of 10 righteous people could have turned that city around. Unfortunately, it was his lot. And the, the conversion of his daughters was even dubious. His wife looked back. But he was a righteous man, it says in 2 Peter. That righteous man vexed his righteous soul day after day, looking at the deeds of the wicked. But uh, he wants us to have an influence. Be holy in the world. Come out from among them. Be separate. 
I remember reading in history about uh, an interesting character in Syria. His name was Simon Stylites. And uh, he was exposed to Christianity uh, when he was about 16 years old, and he just saw how wicked the world was, and he longed for holiness. Well, back then they had these aesthetic monks that would kind of go off and try and live in monasteries to be holy. He did that for a while, and he thought, they're not doing very good either. So he went off to the desert by himself. And he thought, I want to get closer to God. And I don't know what possessed him, but he started climbing on these ruined pillars. That's where they get the word stylite. It's kind of a, I think it's a Greek or Latin word for a pillar. He climbed up there and he said, I'm going to see if I can get close to God. I'm just going to stay up here. And people who saw him as a holy man would bring him food and he'd teach them from his pillar and he would not come down. And I don't know all the particulars about how he handled everything, but for the last 30 years of his life, he lived on a pillar 60 feet high, summer, winter, 24 hours a day for 30 years, praying. People brought ladders to the pillar. They'd go up and they'd ask him for prayers and ask him questions, but he stayed up there on his pillar because he didn't want to get down and be defiled by the world. God is not calling for his people to live on a pillar. God wants us to integrate in society, but he doesn't want society in us. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, it's not of the Father but of the world. And the world will pass away and the lust thereof, but he that does the will of my Father in heaven will abide forever. God wants people that will not just be hearing his will, but doing his will. Karen and I in our worship tonight, as the sun went down, we had our Sabbath worship. We were reading a great devotional talking about how many people honor God with their lips, but their hearts are far away. God wants people that will honor him with their hearts, and then the lips will follow. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not him, in him. I just quoted this uh, verse to you. Romans 12, 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, this is verse 1, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Pure in heart, your mind. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. We ha How do you get new thinking? New input and the Holy Spirit. Pray. Commune with God. Do you know, you become like who you hang out with. It's just, it's a law of life. I remember years ago, Karen and I had dinner after church one day with his family in Northern California. And uh, there was an interesting guest at the table. And he, he looked very much like Elvis Presley. And I was intrigued, and we were talking after dinner, and he shared his testimony, because my mother used to write songs for Elvis. And he said, yeah, when Elvis died, he said, uh, well, first of all, so when I was a young man, I went to some Elvis Presley concert, and I saw the girls swooning and fainting and screaming and throwing their clothes. And he said, I know what I want. I want to be Elvis Presley. And so he started going to Elvis Presley concerts whenever they were around. He watched all of the Elvis movies, and he wasn't much of an actor. But back then, you could pay 25 cents and stay and watch it again and again, and he'd do that. Wallpapered his room with Elvis Presley posters. Got a record player, and he listened to Elvis Presley sing all day long. Bought a guitar, learned to play it. He would sing along with the record player. Dyed his hair black. And he's, for his friends, he started to impersonate Elvis Presley. And he got where he kind of grew into the image. He looked just like him. He knew all the idiosyncrasies, could talk just like him, carry himself just like him. So when Elvis died, he started being among the first that did Elvis Presley impersonations. And he was making a lot of money. Matter of fact, when we met him, he was a 50-year-old Elvis Presley. He said he had just come back from Japan where they paid him $10,000 for a concert. And he told us, he said, you know, uh, I don't know what to do now. He said, I realize I can't do this forever. He was getting a little frumpy. And he said, I don't know who I am. And he said, you know, I, ba I basically picked somebody that died because of drugs as my role model, and it's just empty now. So he showed up at church that day. He had been raised a Christian, but he had gotten his eyes on the world. And I thought to myself, wow, through studying Elvis Presley, he became like Elvis Presley. What if people would do with Jesus what he did with Elvis? What a mighty church we'd have if we would surround ourselves with Christ and think about Christ and think about his teachings and we'd turn the world upside down. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove. And that word there, prove, means that you might test. 
Evaluate what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We should be thinking about, Lord, what is the perfect will? What do you want me to do in practical ways? How can I serve you? How can I change my life to be more Christ-like? Does the Bible encourage simplicity of attire or dress? Well, what about John the Baptist? You know, it says that uh, he wore pretty simple clothing. I'm not saying you're supposed to wear a leather belt and camel skin. But you can't ever argue that John the Baptist was a flamboyant evangelist. In like manner also that the women, this is of course true of men, adorn themselves in modest apparel, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array. And again, who's adorning? Let it not be the outward adorning, the plating of the hair. And there's nothing wrong with braiding your hair. Back in Bible times, uh, the, they used to do elaborate weaves with jewels in their hair to try and outdo each other. And they became so absorbed in fashion. And sometimes a braid is actually very practical depending on what you're doing. Not with the plating of the hair and the wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart. Even the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit which in the sight of God is of great price. You know, I'll tell you, uh, I, I think that um, I, I noticed one of the questions when we interviewed someone on the street. They said, how do you know someone's a Christian? By their jewelry, they said. Did you catch that? So did Jesus tell us to wear the cross or to bear the cross? It's a whole lot easier to wear a cross than bear a cross. Uh, I personally think that... Um, Christian jewelry is actually something of an oxymoron because I can't picture Christ wearing it. I think Jesus calls us for simplicity and modesty. And what I'm sharing with you now is not some unique teaching of the Seventh-day Adventists. What I'm sharing with you now, this is what all Protestants used to teach. They used to say that Christian men and women, uh, and uh, they used to emphasize the women more, they ought to be modest in their apparel. Um, and, and think about this for a moment. <clears throat> that would mean in dress in a way so that you're not deliberately accentuating your sexuality and causing men to stumble. Now, I know it works both ways. But Jesus said, if a man looks on a woman to lust after her in his heart, he's committing adultery in his heart. So if that man is sinning by looking and thinking inappropriate things because the young lady is maybe accentuating too much of her sexuality, then is it a sin for her to deliberately dress in a way that would make men stumble? And you know, if you interview men alone and they're being honest, they'll tell you that it is a real struggle in our society today to maintain purity of mind when you consider the way that people dress and what's going on on television. And Jesus is pretty clear that Christians should be modest. And they're, they're, again, you know, I, I don't want to say too much about it, but I don't think he wants us to uh, be poking holes in our bodies. And uh, let me give you something to think about. There's a Revelation study. There are two women in Revelation. Revelation 12, woman clothed with light, sun, moon, and stars. Who is she? She's the church. Good church or bad church? She is the church of God. We know because the devil wants to destroy her. You got a woman in Revelation 17. She... She's clothed with gold and pearls and costly ray, and she's called a harlot. So do you think she's modestly dressed? The one for the picture we took here, we made it as modest as we could because we needed a G-rated version for our programs. But I doubt she looked like this. So by the way, that your girl is a fine Christian. We needed someone to dress up for us. I felt sorry for her. Anyway, so the woman in Revelation 17 is riding a beast. Who does she represent? Counterfeit church. Do you know neither of those women ever speak? How do we know who they are and what they wear? And like I said, it's true of men also. But we are advertising all the time by what we wear. The Bible says, let it not be the gold and pearls and costly array. You know, I remember a few years ago, a lot of evangelists were in the headlines for scandal. Some of them were caught uh, because of just bad immorality in their lives and it just happened it seemed like one after another for a few months there's just a big meltdown among a lot of the televangelists and got to be careful what i say because i'm a televangelist technically but um, uh, their problem was they're talking about you know uh, everybody sending them their money 
And they said, you know, if you, and they're driving around in, you know, Bentleys and flying private jets, and they're, they're wearing, just, their sets were all gilded and flamboyant. And, and uh, somebody wrote a song. They said, would Jesus wear a Rolex? It became a very popular song. And they were mocking Christianity because of the obvious hypocrisy of these uh, televangelists that said they're Christians, but they sure won't, they didn't look like they were following Jesus around and living a simple life. Now, I'm not saying Christians need to wear rags, obviously. I hope you don't feel that way about what I'm wearing. Uh, interesting story behind this suit. I didn't plan on sharing it with you, but Karen and I landed in Dubai. I had 12 hours to preach. And when I, I had one sermon, and I didn't realize they'd shipped my luggage on to California. And so our host said, oh, you can't wear what you wore traveling. I, you know, I wear a baseball cap and jeans from all those overseas flights. They said, we're going to take you to the mall. You've got to buy a suit. They took me to the most expensive mall in the world and said, you've got to buy a suit. I said, well, if I've got to buy a suit, I'm going to wear it again. So <laughs> what's that? It was on sale. Karen helped me find a place on sale. Matter of fact, this, this is the exact getup, isn't it? The tie, the shirt, the shoes. I had to buy all this stuff. So I, even though the shoes hurt, I wear them because I'm trying to save, get my mileage out of them. Anyway, that's way too much information. But um, back to our study. What was I talking about? Dress. And so we need to be simple in our dress. And God doesn't expect us to wear rags. Uh, Christians should uh, buy good clothing, clean clothing. The idea is don't let someone be distracted by what you wear so they don't know who you are. Some people are insecure about their appearance, and they try to increase their appear, their perceived worth by the clothing they wear, jewelry they wear. That's not what makes us valuable to God. It's what's on the inside. Now, Leviticus 19.28. Uh, it's a good thing we have a small audience here. People might throw tomatoes at me. But the Bible says, you shall not make cuttings in your flesh for the dead, or tattoo marks on you, I am the Lord. Is it just me, or is there an epidemic of tattooing going on in our world? And uh, I, you know, I'm sure there's people here that have tattoos. I know there are. Uh, and there are going to be a lot of people in heaven with tattoos. And, you know, if you made a mistake, just ask God to forgive you. But your body's a temple. What would you think if you had this beautiful, marble, white temple that God has created, and people are out there spraying graffiti on it? We're made in the image of God. Or if you take a jackhammer to that temple and you start poking holes in the wall. Everybody's not only into tattooing, they're into piercing. Piercing everything. Now this, thankfully, is just Photoshop. It would be really troubling to think there was a baby like this. But you know why I show this picture? Is you say, oh, that, that, that is just wrong. Everyone looks at this and goes, that is wrong. You know why? Because a baby, why would you do that to a baby? It's like you're mutilating a baby. Well, you are born again as a Christian. Don't mutilate yourself. You're a child of God. I don't know too many parents that are happy when their kids came, come home and say, want to see my new tattoo, new piercing I've got? Our bodies in the temple. The Bible tells us the prophets of Baal leapt on the altar, cut themselves until the blood gushed out. The devil does believe in body piercing. I can tell you that. Now look what they did to Jesus. He doesn't want us to mutilate our bodies. Now, if you've done that, you know, you, get, you come, whatever your past is, you come to Jesus just like you are, he'll forgive you. And you might not even be able to remove your tattoos and he'll forgive you. I mean, sometimes it's just not practical. So I don't want to make anyone feel like, oh, now what have I done? You know, I've defiled my body. You come, he'll give you a born again experience. But if you haven't done it, don't do it. Nobody's preaching about this anymore. The Bible says you're not supposed to do that. What type of music well, a true Christian, I'm leaving no stone unturned. I figure I'll hit it, hit it hard, and then move on. You notice I wait until the second to the last meeting so I can run for cover when this is over. What type of music will a true Christian enjoy? He has put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Now, music is a difficult subject because it sounds so subjective, but there actually are principles on what might draw a line between what is appropriate music and what isn't. And if you're not sure, stay as far away from the line as you can. I remember as a young person, I used to go to uh, rock concerts, and it was just noise and bedlam and riots and drugs. And, you know, you never turn on the news and have them say, well, there was a riot, and they had a stampede at a concert for Beethoven. 
No, they don't ever say that. Yeah, there was, an up, there was an uproar, and they had a riot, and violence broke out at a Mozart concert. Now, those are extremes. I'm not saying it has to be Beethoven or Mozart, but um, you can just tell. Notice, when King Saul was troubled by an evil spirit, 1 Samuel 16, 23, it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, David took a harp, and he played with his hand, and so Saul was refreshed and well, and the evil spirit departed. The right kind of music can drive an evil spirit away. Does it stand to reason? The wrong kind of music can bring an evil spirit in. A lot of Christians are out there listening to what I would call the wrong kind of music. And uh, I know I'm just like everybody else. There are certain kinds of music that I listen to, and it might attract, it's appealing maybe to your lower nature, but I'm saying, this is not helping me spiritually. And it's not just rock music. You know, there are good songs that may not be Christian. Not, not every song has to be a Christian song. You can sing a folk song. The Bible says there's a place for a love song. You got one in the Bible called Song of Solomon. So there's, and that's, you know, you and your wife or your fiance, there's an appropriate time and place for all different kinds of music. A lullaby to put your child to sleep. And there's a, there's a song for victory after a war. They sang those songs after they crossed the Red Sea. So there's different kinds of music for different occasions. Uh, some churches are getting all the occasions mixed up. And sometimes they're singing what sounds like a romance song, and they sing it to Jesus, and everybody's singing it together. And it's, uh, all you got to do is take the word Jesus out, and it's about your boyfriend. It just doesn't sound right. Or they're singing a war song, and they do it in church. <laughs> it's, it sounds like when uh, Joshua came... To, that met Moses coming down the mountain. He says, there's a sound of war in the camp. And Moses said, that's not the sound of those who cry for being overcome or those who shout for victory. It's the voice of those that sing, I do hear. It was a worship service gone bad is what happened when they were worshiping the golden calf. By the way, you know what they made the golden calf out of? Their jewelry that they got from the Egyptians. And that's what's happened in a lot of Christian churches. Is the typical dancing good recreation for a Christian? Well, you know, there's dancing. You can, King David danced before the Lord. Miriam led the ladies in dancing. You notice Miriam wasn't dancing with the men. But led the ladies out in a victory dance. The women danced together when David and Saul came back from victory over the Philistines. Jephthah's daughter came out dancing when he came back from victory. There are times to shout for joy. I remember once dancing, just hopping up and down, clapping my hands to the Lord when I was studying Daniel chapter Nine, and I finally understood that prophecy about Jesus coming again. I was up there just, I couldn't keep still. David danced before the Lord when they brought the ark up to Jerusalem. And, you know, so there, there, you go to a Jewish wedding, there's an appropriate celebration at the, at least the old Jewish weddings. I'm not talking about any kind of Jewish wedding. The men actually dance with the men. They do these clever dances and they dance before the bride and the groom and so I'm not saying all dancing is wrong, but a lot of the dancing going on in the world today is very sexually suggestive and it's gyrating certain parts of the anatomy that should not be accentuated in public. And uh, he that abides in him ought himself so to walk even as he walked. Now I know I'm talking about a lot of different things today. If you're ever in doubt about what to do, say what would Jesus do? That's one rule. And the better you know him, I just can't see Jesus at the typical club out there on the floor with the lights flashing, bouncing around, people scantily clad, intoxicated. Uh, and they say, oh, I do it for exercise, Pastor Doug. <laughs> uh, you go to the health club. <laughs> and teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. Yeah, sometimes there's self-denial involved. We should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. God is calling us to holy living friends. Can you say amen? amen? Will a Christian play the lottery or gamble? Told you we're going to cover it. <laughs> For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrow. It is shocking how many people are addicted to gambling. You know, we're in California. We're not too far from, of course, Reno, Nevada. But you don't have to go to Nevada anymore. They got the Indian casinos all around. And uh, I've counseled and worked with Christians who fell into gambling and they just, they lost everything. And it was an addiction. They lost their, their home, their marriages, their health, their retirement from gambling. 
should a Christian support anything that is uh, addicting? And a lot of people don't even go to the casino. They start gambling on their phones. They start gambling on their computers, and they lose fortunes doing that. How do we get rich? Gambling or working? Laboring faithfully, the Bible says. As we commanded you that he that would not work should not eat. It's a very simple principle. God will bless your industry. He that makes haste to be rich shall not be innocent. The idea of gambling is to try to get rich at the expense of someone else's loss hastily. And you're not really investing in labor or intelligence. In, uh, we actually had a gentleman came to a meeting like this. He was a very successful professional gambler. And he was convicted. And now he's out doing mission work. It's a wonderful testimony. I think, I think it's at the Amazing Facts Testimony website. What should be the aim of God's people today? What's our purpose in life? That we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. You know, friends, I can promise you some people are going to hear this. They're going to say, oh, Pastor Doug's being legalistic because I'm talking about specifics. You know, when Jesus introduced people to the, to the Lord and who he was, he then often dealt with specifics. He met the woman at the well. And he said, I'm offering you this living water. And she said, oh, I want that water. He said, okay, you do? Go call your husband. Oh, wait a second. Let's change the subject. So that's right. You've had five husbands. And you're living with a guy you're not married to right now. Is Jesus being legalistic? Now, he wanted to save her, but he had to address the sin in her life. Nathan the prophet had to go to David one day and said, Thou art the man. I mean, sometimes you've got to be specific. How do you know what to repent of unless preachers are faithfully saying some of the specifics? Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Now, you've got the Ten Commandments, but I've itemized some practical ways you could play that out in our modern world. God wants us to avoid worldliness. What will the angels do at Jesus' second coming? He said, if you love me, keep my commandments, for this is the love of God that we should keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. I delight to do your will, O oh my God, yea, your law is within my heart. And the angels will gather together the elect and they'll also take away everything that offends and that they're going to be destroyed. I delight to do your will. So if we're doing God's will, is it to be a burden or is it to be a delight? It says his law is in our hearts. Why is the Christian calling? Question 15, such a high calling. Why is a Christian life such a high calling? Answer, it says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should call forth the praises. Show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God has called us to a life of godliness and holiness. You know, I've, just, I've got a few verses here. I just thought I ought to read to you real quick. 1 Thessalonians 3.13, so that he might establish your hearts blameless in holiness before God and the Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Ephesians 4.24, that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. 1 Thessalonians 4.7 and 8, for God did not call us to uncleanness but to holiness. Therefore, who, he who rejects this does not reject man but God, who's given us his Holy Spirit. And then Hebrews 12, 14, pursue peace, something to be pursued with all people, and pursue what? Pursue holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. So it's something that should be sought after. I remember hearing a story years ago about this, uh, this old bachelor who lived by himself in kind of a frumpy home, and every day he'd walk through town and he'd you know, meet some of his old buddies at the VFW for lunch, and, and then after lunch he'd walk home. And he noticed that one day in the window of an antique store along the way, he saw this beautiful vase, and it just struck him. He thought it was so striking and beautiful and iridescent, and he would stand there and he'd look at it, and he'd move a little bit, and they had lights on it, and he thought, well, that's, that's beautiful. And he wasn't a very cultured man, but he said, I could spot something beautiful, and he'd go home. On the way to lunch again, he'd stop and he'd look at it. This happened for several days. He'd pause, just stare at it. It's a small town. The proprietor knew him. He stepped to the door one day. He said, Fred, why do you just keep looking at it? Why don't you buy it and take it home? You could look at it all day long. He said, how much? He told him. He said, oh, it's high, but I can do it. So he bought it. 
bought the vase, brought it home, looked around his, his living room, set it on the mantle above the fireplace. And he sat down in his chair and he looked at it. And he thought, wow, it's just beautiful, but I had no idea how bad the paint was looking back there. It was all peeling. And so he, uh, he took the vase down and he painted the wall. He put it back up and he thought, well, that looks better. And then he said, wow, the curtains are looking pretty dingy too. Now that I painted the walls, he said, I haven't changed the curtains in 40 years. And they are kind of covered in dust. And so he got a lady neighbor to help him pick out some curtains. He put some new curtains up in his house and sat down in his chair to look at the vase up on the mantel. And springs are popping out of his chair. He said, you know, this is all kind of falling apart around me. I didn't realize it. And, and uh, so lo and behold, he said, I probably ought to have this reupholstered. And he had his chair fixed. It was his favorite chair. He wanted to save it. Then he sat the chair down. It was on this old stained carpet. He said, I probably need a new carpet. And he took out the carpet. He put a new carpet in. And, and then he walked out and he saw the fence falling down. And he said, wow, I had no idea how I was letting all of this just go to pieces. And little by little, his whole house was renovated. And someone said, Fred, what happened? He said, I put a beautiful vase in the middle of the house, and it changed everything. You know, when you bring Christ into your heart, the purity of Christ in your heart will little by little stand in condemnation of whatever sin is there. It won't happen all at once. It's like if you've been in the dark for a long time and someone turns on the light, it hurts at first. Don't be discouraged if I cover a subject like this and you go, Pastor Doug, this is heavy. I got a long way to go. That's a good sign. God is calling you to the light. Invite Jesus and his purity into your heart and he will begin sanctifying you. It's a process of a lifetime. You continue to grow closer to the Lord and as you take a step closer to the light, you might discover there's some more stains on your clothes you didn't know about. But you don't stop. Don't turn back to the dark. You keep walking towards Jesus and fix your eyes on Jesus. You will become more and more like him. Is that your desire, friends? I'd like to pray with you and just ask right now that you might have that experience. And the Lord will show you where you need to begin in your life to make some changes, to kind of redecorate, have a makeover, and start looking like and acting like and living like a real Christian, getting the world ready, being his ambassador. Father in heaven, Dear Lord, we come to you in Jesus' name and we pray that you will give us the Holy Spirit. Without you, we can do nothing, but we believe the promise through Christ all things are possible. Lord, you came to set the captive free and I discussed tonight a lot of areas where people are just in bondage to the world, to the devil. Break those chains. Give them victory. Help them make the practical changes that they need to be real Christians. And I pray you'll bless the church with revival. Help us not be afraid of this subject of holy living and that we will make our minds up to fix our eyes on Christ, laying aside every sin and the weight that does so easily beset us and to run that race with endurance, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And we ask all of this in his blessed name. Amen. God bless you, friends. Don't go away. I'm going to come back and try and answer some of your Bible questions in just a moment. the rest of that beatitude. Would you like to see God face to face? Train up a child in the way he should go. 
even when he's old, he will not depart from it. Did you know Amazing Facts has a free Bible school that you can do from the comfort of your own home? It includes 27 study lessons to aid in your study of God's Word. Sign up today by calling 1-844-215-7000. That's 1-844-215-7000. Hello, friends. We'd like to welcome you all back to Revelation Now. We've come to the portion of the program where we're going to take your Bible questions. We always enjoy this time, Pastor Doug. Mm -hmm. And of course, we don't know what the questions would be, but we always welcome folks who send in their questions on uh, this topic that we spoke about today, um, the ambassadors of Christ, Christian standards, or if you have another Bible-related question, we'd like to take it. Now, unfortunately, Pastor Doug, this is going to be our um, second to last a question and answer time connected with Revelation Now. Right. But it might be a good time for us to remind our friends that uh, we do this once a week. We have a radio program called Bible Answers Live. Maybe some of you are watching, you're aware of that. Mm -hmm. But that's every Sunday evening. We take uh, a whole hour to take people's Bible questions on the air. So it's a radio program. You can also watch on Facebook and people call in with their Bible questions. So mm -hmm. if you've never participated in that, We'd encourage you to do that. That's 7 p.m. Uh, Pacific time on a Sunday evening. We take Bible questions. Yeah, and it's on, of course, we're on satellite radio, mm -hmm. which can be heard across the country, as well as stations all the way from, I think, 300 stations from California to New York. And, mm -hmm. yep. and then on Facebook around the world. Yep, so. of course. All right, well, we have some questions. We'll take the ones that we have up on the screen first. It says, what are some of the greatest dangers for Christians today? Well, I think some of the greatest dangers are, of course, worldliness and uh, the media. Mm. Um, there, there's so much information that is just bombarding the senses, especially the young people, that is teaching morals and values that are very different. And you can just look at what's happened um, in the last, you know, 150 years. Um, the entertainment has sort of made the moral values of the culture continue to go down. And you can look at the, the values of the world used to be, you know, below the church. But as the values of the world have gone down, the church has always just seems to be a little better than the world. Now what's happening is the, the morals and values of the world are actually lower than where uh, the church are lower than where the world used right. to be. Uh, and I think a lot of that has come to do from uh, Christians having um, just freely watching uh, what the media puts out. Now, there's some good things that you might see on, on television or a DVD, but uh, people are not being as careful through constant bombardment. Folks are just getting used to watching programming that is killing, stealing, lying, committing adultery, and, and it's just, I think it's um, things that used to make us blush don't make us blush anymore. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be one of the big areas. Okay, very good. Our next question that we have, it says, Ain't standards cultural? Shouldn't they change with the times? Well, certain things do change with the times. Styles change. I think it was John Wesley that said, uh, we should not be the first to adopt a new style or the last. But not if that style is, you know, violating some biblical principle of morality. And so there are cultural things that are different. You know, as you go to from place to place, Karen and I travel, and you do too. You, know, you go, some countries, we take off our shoes. Mm -hmm. We went to church in India where there were 160,000 people coming to church. They all took off their shoes, and they had company hoes for all the shoes. There's nothing wrong with that, so we take off our shoes. There's different things that have changed through history that are not moral issues. And I think a Christian should freely adopt cultural changes so that you can fit in and be a good witness if it doesn't violate a moral principle. Right. That's the big right. issue. Okay, we have another question on the screen. It says, what does it mean to tempt God? The Bible speaks about not tempting God. Well, the devil asked Jesus if he would jump off the pinnacle of the temple. And he said, you know, if, if you really have faith, God will catch you in your, his hands. Jesus said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord. So when we abuse God's protection or we, you know, or we recklessly put God to the test and uh, say, well, if you're really God, you know, I'm going uh, to try and commit suicide and see if you save me. Mm. 
or um, uh, there's a thousand different scenarios I guess a person could make up. You don't want to ever push God to the limit and you know get into trouble and just ask him to get you out again. Sometimes we tempt the Lord because we say, well, God has forgiven me of this for so many times. I'm going to do it again and just ask him to forgive me. And it's like we're not really repenting. We're playing Russian roulette. So that's another way people tempt the Lord. Okay. All right. Well, we've got some questions that have been sent in. And this one, Pastor Doug, is from the Middle East. And this person is asking, can Muslims get to heaven? Uh, they don't believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and that he died on the cross for our sins. But can they still be saved? Well, there are, um, there's that verse there where Peter tells us in Acts chapter 4, there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody saved is saved by Jesus. Nobody is saved by, no offense, but nobody's saved by Muhammad or Buddha or Krishna or any other person. The only one who can save is Jesus. Now, there may be some people from other cultures and other backgrounds that will be in the kingdom because they lived up to the light they had they sought after God, and they just they lived at a time of darkness, and God winked at it. You get the story of Nahum and the leper. He turned to the true God. Uh, he went home to Syria, and he said, you know, I, I live in a culture where we're surrounded with idols, and, and I'm actually, the, the king leans on me when he goes to worship in the house of, uh, what is it, Milcom or whatever, whoever the God was. And uh, Isaiah, uh, Elisha said, go in peace. So, he, you know, he recognized, uh, I'm going to be surrounded by this culture, but I, I'm believing in the true God now. And so I think for anybody to be saved, you need to really turn to the truth, turn to the light. Mm -hmm. Christ said, if you did not know, if you have no uh, knowledge, then you have no sin. In other words, if a person is totally in ignorant, this is why a baby, before the age of accountability, they're innocent. People who maybe grow up in abject darkness to the truth, they follow all the light they have, they're never exposed to the truth. Um, I, I think that God's going to surprise us and save some of those people. And it's interesting, missionaries have gone into foreign countries and sometimes they'll meet a person that seems to have the spirit of God, but they knew nothing about Jesus because they just loved truth. We might find some of those people in heaven, but nobody's saved by virtue of Muhammad. Okay. Somebody else is asking, uh, will God or when will God seal his people? Well, uh, you know, he, first of all, everybody needs to be sealed with the Holy Spirit. But there's a special sealing of God and marking of the beast that happens in the last days when these issues of uh, who we obey are really going to be brought to the forefront. And it's going to be made a, an issue of, you know, which side are you on? Are you going to bow to the image of the beast or are you going to stand up for God? There's a special sealing that comes to God's people. Now, God's people can receive the seal now. Uh, you know, we can get the seal of the Holy Spirit now. Mm -hmm. and, and uh, keeping the Sabbath is sort of an example that we worship the God of the Bible. It's right there in the middle of his law. It's it got the word holy. Um, but uh, everyone needs the seal of the Holy Spirit. You can get that now. Okay. But the mark of the beast hasn't happened yet. All right, somebody's asking, Mark chapter 14 uh, and verse 51 to 52, it speaks about a young man who fled away at the time of Christ's crucifixion. Apparently, they laid hold of him, and he left his garment in the yes. hand of the man, and he fled away. Do you know who this? Do we know who this person is? You know, the Bible scholars are fairly certain it is Mark. Now, young John Mark, one who Peter dictated, probably the Gospel of Mark is largely the Gospel of Peter. None of the other Gospels mention this young man who was probably lingering outside of the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was arrested. He wanted to be close. Uh, he knew where the apostles went. He may have been related to Peter in some way. And when Christ was arrested, he followed from a distance. He just had his bedclothes wrapped around him. And he wanted to see what was happening. The guards tried to grab him, and he shook free and ran naked, kind of like Joseph with uh, his robe and Potiphar's wife. <laughs> they think it was John Mark, because he would be the one who would have intimate knowledge of that. Right. Okay, well, we have another question. This is from a 13-year-old, and... Uh, I'm assuming it's a boy. He says, along with being very strong, was Samson a giant? You know, the amazing thing about Samson is when his hair was cut off, it says, uh, he even told Delilah, he says, if I, when he finally divulged the truth, he said, you know, I've been a Nazarite from my youth. And if I were to be shorn of my seven locks, he said, I'll be as weak as other men. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, I'm sure he was a fine physical specimen, but it wasn't that that gave him his strength. 
it was the Spirit of God. It says, when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, he killed the Philistines, he killed the lion. When the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, he pushed down Dagon's temple. And so it was really the Spirit of the Lord. I don't think Samson was um, you know, 20 feet tall or anything. Yeah. Okay. Here's another question. This is kind of a deep one. It says, is it possible to forgive and forget deep offenses that someone has done to you? Well, don't forget the promise in the Bible, all things are possible with God. But God does not require us to forget everything in order to forgive a person. You know, um, I think if someone's deeply hurt you, God has created people with minds where we are trained when we experience pain, that helps us remember. And if you've had a really painful experience, it's hard to forget that. You can choose to forgive the person, and that means you choose not to dwell on it or always remind them that you've forgiven them. We all know people that forgive us and they keep reminding us they forgave us. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you can choose not to think about it. And I've repeated this many times. You can't prevent the birds from flying over your head, but you can prevent them from making a nest in your hair. So if, if you're reminded, you know, I've had this happen to me. Some people really offended me and I forgave them. And then it would come back what they did. And I'd have to tell myself, you forgave them. Lord, take that away. I don't want to dwell on it. And I found that every time I said that, it became less and less, so I don't think about it anymore. Mm -hmm. But you got to work on it. And yeah, he can deliver you from those memories. Okay. All right, another question. Did John the Baptist know that Jesus, his cousin, was the Messiah? I don't think John recognized it. I think the real epiphany for John came when Jesus walked. Because uh, the Lord said, and, and you might have to help me remember this verse. I think it's in the Gospel of John that the Lord spoke to John and said, on whomever you see the Holy Spirit fall, mm -hmm. he is the one. And John saw Jesus. He saw the Holy Spirit come upon him. He said, that's the one. The Holy Spirit revealed to John, this is the Messiah, the Christ. And so up until that point, I don't think that John knew until it was supernaturally revealed to him there at the Jordan River. The verse you're referring to is First John chapter 1, verse 33. Is it First John or John? Uh, sorry, just John 1, John, yeah. 33. It says, uh, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descend and remain upon him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Amen. So that's a good verse there. All right, another question that we have. What kind of song had sung or was sung um, the Lord Jesus with his disciples in Matthew 26, verse 30? And I think it's referring to the upper room. Yes. Where it says they sang a song and then they, they left and went to the Mount of Olives. You know, we could guess uh, there are several of the psalms that were what they called the, the Paschal Psalms or their songs for the Passover. And there, I don't know which one they sang, so it would be just speculation. I don't have a list in front of me, but I think 60, Psalm 69 may have been one of the Passover psalms. They could have sung it. They could have sung Psalm 22 was a Passover psalm, which is what Jesus quoted from the cross. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, we'll have to ask him when we get to heaven. It could have been one of several. Okay. Uh, I, I look forward to hearing Jesus sing. I think he probably had a nice That's voice. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, somebody's asking, why isn't the tribe of Ephraim included in the list given of the 144,000? I'm glad they asked. Someone caught that, that in, uh, in the 144,000, two tribes are left out. Ephraim, Ephraim sort of, you know, is included in the fact that Joseph is mentioned. But Ephraim, it says in, uh, is it Hosea, where it says Ephraim is joined to his idols, leave him alone. The, the nation of Ephraim had sort of turned to idolatry and it sounded like God finally said, look, you've rejected me, I'm turning away. And in the, the prophecies that Jacob gave regarding Dan, he said, Dan is like a viper. And so these two tribes, because of what their names meant in those prophecies, they were removed and instead you have Levi included and you have Joseph included. And the word Joseph means adding or added. And it is interesting, I think you mentioned a little earlier, that the, the, the order in which the names are listed in Revelation chapter 7 is unique. It is. You know, it yeah. doesn't begin with the oldest. Usually it begins with the oldest. It starts out with Reuben, ends with Benjamin, but right. not this list. Yeah. yeah, so it's a little different. Okay, another question that we have. Um, Romans chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, talks about authorities being appointed by God, and they're just asking for an explanation of that. How do we apply that today? Romans 13, verse 1 and 2. Well, yeah, I think that uh, <laughs> people often get the leadership they deserve. <laughs> and, but God, he does appoint certain authorities. 
And when he says appointed authorities here, I don't think God is speaking about a specific individual. I think he means that God has arranged that in society there's going to be authority that must be respected, whether it is a mayor, governor, police, president, sheriff, you know, mm -hmm. and we should abide by the rules. Mm -hmm. Most societies have, you know, most of the laws are based on good reason, and uh, we should respect those. You know, most of the cultures in the world, their laws are based on the Ten Commandments. I don't know anywhere it's legal to murder. Right. or steal or lie. And so uh, we should obey the laws of the land. And I know it's hard sometimes for us to obey that speed limit. <laughs> hey, Pastor Ross. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm guilty, I'm yeah you're making me, huh? Yeah. <clears throat> I got pulled over this week. Karen was with me. I asked for mercy, and they gave us mercy. Praise the Lord. All I right. was in a hurry to do God's business. That hasn't happened to me for a long time, Pastor Doug. It's just you got lucky. <laughs> All right, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, who are the ones that mourn? And uh, Revelation 1, 7 says, Behold, he comes with clouds, every eye shall see him. Those also that pierced him, and the nations shall mourn. Who are the ones that mourn? Yeah, and I think it's also in Matthew, uh, is it 25? Then all the tribes of the earth will see him coming, and they will mourn. Mm. Um, it's speaking of those that are lost, because the majority of the world, see, Christians are part of the tribe of God. The 144,000 is also symbolic of God's tribe. All the other tribes are the lost. And uh, those that are not caught up to meet the Lord in the air when he comes are the tribes of the earth. They will all mourn mm. his coming because they're going to, what's it say? They're going to call for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them and hide, hide them from the mm. face of him that sits on the throne. Yeah. So much of the world, the Lord's coming is not a good day. For the saved, it is a blessed hope. For the lost, it says it is a day of darkness. And... Um, it's called the Day of the Lord, and it's, it's going to be an awesome time of judgment for most of the world. Okay. All right, here's an interesting question. It says, before Christ, the nation of Israel was chosen and blessed by God. Do you think that there is any parallel with the U.S.? Well, I have no question that God chose the United States to be a place that would be fertile ground for Christianity, Protestantism to explode. Because right after the beast received its deadly wound, God provided a nation that would be largely comprised of immigrants who came, many of them fleeing religious persecution. And it took a few uh, generations or, for us to get our footing about religious freedom, but with Roger Williams and uh, the influence he had on the early government, by the time they got to the Constitution, we recognized the importance of having a government where people had freedom to worship and they also had freedom of, uh, to select their leaders. And in that environment, uh, Christianity exploded from coast to coast in North America. And not everyone was a Christian, but it became a really great environment for uh, Christianity to flourish. And there were several great enlightenments in America with everyone from George Whitfield and John Wesley to Jonathan Edwards and to Charles Finney. There are several great revivals that spread across Billy Sunday, even the revivals of Billy Graham. Mm -hmm. There have been times of great revival. A and um, so God has, I think, exploited the freedom here for that purpose. And also great missionary activity. A yeah. lot of printing of Bibles and Christian literature and uh, even the use of media today. A lot of it is coming from North America in the proclamation of the gospel. Y and I'll mention something with that. Uh, the American ideal of freedom started here and it spread. You know, Karen and I have been to North and South Korea. We got to step over the border in North Korea. Two completely different worlds. One is so sad and so dark and so poor. And South Korea, where America fought for the freedom, then gave them their freedom. Christianity's exploded in the country. Great prosperity, great blessing. They're sending missionaries around the world. So those ideals, as they spread to other countries of freedom of religion, it, it uh, really helped the mission of around the, go around the world. Okay. Somebody's asking, how did Moses change God's mind if God knows everything? And I think they're referring to where Moses says, Lord, blot them out of your book or blot my name out of your book. Well, that's a figure of speech. I mean, uh, God knows everything. You never surprise the Lord. And when you confess your sins, you don't say, Lord, sit down. I'm going to really, I got something shocking to tell you. He knows everything. When it says he changed his mind through Moses' prayer and intercession, God was pleased that Moses was yeah. praying. It was the Spirit of God in Moses mm -hmm. that made Moses plead with the Lord to show mercy to Israel. God wanted that. But he said, okay, okay, 
uh, I've relented. I'll change my mind. So um, I think God is always anxious for us to plead with him for mercy. And I think we also see that illustrating the situation with the angels that went to Sodom, yeah. where Abraham sort of interceded for Lot. God didn't have to tell Abraham that he's going to destroy the city. It's as if God was almost looking for someone to intercede. To intercede exactly. So a type of Christ. Good point. Good sense. point. Again, we want to thank all of those who have sent in their questions. I want to remind you, we will be taking questions tomorrow. Now, tomorrow morning, our program is a little different. It starts at 11 a.m. We have yes. a Sabbath morning program. We'll have a presentation from 11 till about 12 Pacific time. And then we're going to take our final uh, Q&A session. So if you have a Bible question, make sure that you send it in, and we'll try and answer as many of those as we can. And that will, of course, be tomorrow morning, our time, mm -hmm. and uh, 11 uh, a.m. Pacific time. Yeah, we're gonna the message tomorrow. We're gonna be talking about the goal of the godly, and we're gonna really summarize what the message of Revelation is all about. To uh, it's called the revelation of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. and the purpose of the message and the study is to transform us into the image of the author of Revelation. That's Jesus. If you'd like to know what can I do or how can I know that I'm converted, then you're gonna want to tune in tomorrow morning. You can send a text or an email to your friends and say, make sure and catch. The Revelation Now program tomorrow morning, we're going to sort of have our big finale. And in the question time, we're going to be dealing with some of the biggest and most important questions about how to prepare for Jesus coming and what is going on in the world right now. So they don't want to miss that, uh, that special program. And I should mention that even though we are reaching the end of the programs, you can go to Revelation Now, watch the archives of anything that you've missed. We haven't covered all the lessons there are some lessons that we didn't get to cover, but we are making them available for free. So go to the materials that are supplied, and you're going to see you can download several lessons that we just didn't have the schedule on the calendar to cover. Please study those lessons as well, and I, I know they'll be blessed by that. We want to also remind you about our free gift for today, a book entitled Alone in the Crowd. And we encourage you to go ahead and text the word crowd to the number 40544. You'll be able to get a digital download of the book or just go to Revelation Now if you're outside of North America and you can download the book for yourself. You'll find this very encouraging. This is a classic book, Pastor Doug. Amen. It's been written a number of years, but it's blessed many. Amen. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow. God bless, friends. Good evening, everyone. I hope you're richly blessed. What a message to wake us up and let us know God really wants to have full control of our lives to make those beautiful, life-changing, transforming changes in our lives to conform our will to his will. So whatever the light that is shown upon you today, don't resist. As you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Respond and be willing to be made willing to follow what God is showing you is the truth and light from his word. I pray that you would join us if you wish and you're looking for a local in Portland, Oregon area, a local fellowship group, please remember us, Stone Tower, Seventh-day Adventist Church. Come and you, we would love to minister to your needs and to help you to have a greater understanding and love for your Savior and his holy word. So again, I want to invite you. We're looking forward to tomorrow's last message. Sabbath at 11 tomorrow. And Pastor Bachelor will be sharing with us the goal of the godly. Sound like a, a message, a beautiful message that none of us need to miss. So lovingly and warmly, will you join me as we have a word of prayer to conclude? Loving Father, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your promises. And may thy Holy Spirit allow the words and the seeds to lay deep root on our hearts, that truly our lives may be conformed to your will and reflect more and more thy glory and restore your image in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You all have a blessed evening. Looking forward to seeing you tomorrow at 11. Good night.